This is All India Radio. In the program Spotlight, we now bring you Gear India series special discussion on Empowering Women, Empowering Nation. The participants are Professor Sushila Ramaswamy, expert on women issues, and Sonu Sood, AIR correspondent. Today, Prime Minister Narendra Modi participated in a unique program on women empowerment attended by over 2 lakh women in Prayagraj, Uttar Pradesh. He transferred a total of 1,000 crore rupees in the bank accounts of self-help groups benefiting around 16 lakh women members. Women's empowerment has been a key goal of the present government. Ma'am, can you tell us about the significance of government's efforts towards women's empowerment and how will empowering women benefit our economy and society at large. Women's empowerment lies at the core of modern society. This is because it's only last 300 years worldwide there is a realization that unless women are given an equitable and level playing field in not only politics but in society at large, it's only then that society will truly progress. It all started in the late 18th century and since then, country after country have realized the importance of women's empowerment. Even during our nationalist struggle, Brahman was the first one to emphasize on women's equitable status. During Gandhi's stewardship of the Congress, women played a very significant role. Post-independence, the continuous effort was to see to it that women in India would fare on an equitable and on a dignified level. Having said this, the fact is that the present government takes these initiatives all the more seriously. Last five years, there have been a slew of projects which have been announced to see to it that girls, women, particularly from the disadvantaged, the marginalized sections of our society, truly can become dignified and self-reliant citizens of this country. So women's empowerment is the key, as it's often said, not only to social stability, political growth, economic prosperity, but increasingly even seen as the key thing to sustainable development, particularly at a time when the worldwide there is a concern for climate change and its impact. And we have seen in course of the last two years of the pandemic, how women have taken both the brunt of the pandemic in the sense that, yes, all of us have suffered, but women have suffered much more. This is what has been well documented. So all the more governments have realized the importance of initiatives to see to it that women get a better deal and women are at the center of their welfare programs. Women represent nearly 50% of the population and empowering women and increasing the labor force participation rate among women, which is still low in India, will boost the economy. You feel there is a large underutilized potential there. And do you feel government schemes aimed at encouraging women to start working and earning will contribute to the prosperity of the country? Of course, you see, in India, we do have one, of course, of the organized sector. And here, women are found in considerably reasonable numbers. Gunnar Middal, in the 1960s, when he wrote his monumental book called The Asian Drama, he mentions this, how Indian women have made enormous strides in various walks of life. And in the informal structure, the fact, informal sector of the economy also, women continue to contribute a great deal. So certainly women, women's uh, role in economic growth, in economic development is an important requirement for the overall prosperity and growth. And it is this realization that has made governments realize, and particularly this government realize, the importance of women-centric programs. And as I just said, in course of last two years, how women as health workers, women's positions or women's jobs in the economy and also increasingly the kind of violence and other physical crimes that have been committed against women in course of the pandemic, how all these have become much more in terms of last two years. So keeping all this in mind, it becomes necessary for welfare schemes and the state must play a proactive role and that is what the Indian government is also trying to do. 
Ma'am, in view of the Prime Minister's vision to empower women by providing them with necessary skills, incentives and resources, can you tell us about the significance of self-help groups in creating employment opportunities for women and making them self-reliant, as you said? Self-help groups, women have come together. For instance, you have examples like Seva, which was started by Ela Bhatt, the famous Gandhian. Then there are so many others which are found in the small-scale sector of the economy, like you know, what is generally called cottage industries or small scale. Historically also, if you look at it, women have always contributed within the domestic economy, so as to speak. And that is how, you see, it becomes necessary for women to be involved. And the fact is women also are mothers, women are also wives, they take care of their families. And that also takes enormous amount of their time and resources. So keeping all that in mind, it's important that women are able to contribute and opportunities must be there to see to it that women as mothers, as wives, as family caregiver, and at the same time, if they can contribute to the savings in the family, to the income that comes in the family, all the more it becomes necessary. And it's in that context, you see, that the government's encouragement of self-help, because these are generally initiatives which are essentially women-centric. It enables women to be able to organize their time, keeping in mind their various multifaceted responsibilities. To take an example, Beti Bachao, Beti Parhao Andolan was launched in 2015 to address various uh, discriminations faced by girls in the society and change the mindset of the citizens towards girls. Besides ensuring education of the girl child, the scheme focused on issues like decreasing child sex ratio, removal of gender inequality, protecting the girl child and women empowerment. Can you tell us about the importance of such schemes in creating awareness about the areas where women need empowerment? This is preference for a male child. It's considered to be worldwide. And in Asia, it is much more. And countries like India, of course, one is aware of the fact that families, and this cuts across all families, all segments of the population. The fact is that female feticide, I mean, the girl child is not even allowed to be born. That itself is, has lent, has contributed to the sex imbalance in society. And the implications of it is far reaching. We read about how in certain parts of India, rooms are not able to get brides. So they kind of go search for brides from other parts of India. So that leads to a problem of cultural adjustment. Then this whole thing about paying dowry to the girl's family to be able to get the girl to marry their son. All these are aberrations and distortions which have been extensively written about. Plus, as I said at the beginning, that this craze for a son, that needs to be offset by proper education and sensitization about the fact that in today's world, where one is understood in terms of how one attains one's intellectual capabilities or our achievements, it has nothing to do with one's sex. And women have proved that they are equally capable of achieving many of the outstanding uh, skills that were considered to be exclusively men. In many, many areas, women have even kind of, you can say, broken down the glass ceiling or they have broken down even the taboos that are there, that these are specifically man's job or it's a man's world. So given all that, yes, those achievements are there, but there is also the other side where the girl child is not allowed to be born in the fetus itself. Even if the girl child is allowed to be born, then the kind of discrimination, the inequities that the girl child faces, keeping all this in mind, the realization is that if the government can step in and provide that extra incentive, and the families will also feel a little more encouraged to take care of their girl child, and that is important. For instance, studies have proved one thing, that the desire for the male child was also there in countries like South Korea. But South Korea took a very proactive role in not only educating its population, but also having a great number of initiatives 
so that families are encouraged to see to it that their daughters, the girl child and their families are taken good care of. So similar initiatives in India is something that's what this Beti Bachao, Beti Padao scheme is all about. And it should be welcomed considering, as you just said, women and men are complementary in society. Women constitute nearly 50% of the population or are more than 50% in many parts of India. So the fact is that women and men together make society and unless we recognize this complementary role and allow both of them equal space and equal opportunities and women in particular greater dignity, a society will not really prosper. Let's not forget what Swami Vivekananda told us. If we ignore women, then our civilization will be the one which will suffer. The hallmark of a good civilization, I'm just paraphrasing what he said, what Swamiji said, the hallmark of a good civilized society is the way it treats its women. So can you tell us about the progress made in the field of ensuring women's security at workplace? Because empowering women, a very major aspect of it is that they contribute to the society, they become financially independent, and for that, they have to work. So what is the status and how far do you think we have progressed in ensuring that women are secure at their workplaces? This has to be understood at the following levels. First and foremost, the earnings of the woman should be treated as the woman's income. And it is not that the man in her family, be it the father or the husband or the son, would decide how she spends the money and where she's going to be spending it. Having control over her income is a very important aspect of that empowerment. Inheritance. Women, of course, in the Indian constitution have been given equitable inheritance rights. And, of course, there are many efforts to see to it that women along or daughters along with the sons inherit property on an equal terms. But we have seen that there are aberrations, there are distortions to this, and it's important to take these corrective measures. So inheritance is something, again, which needs to be protected. Furthermore, at the workplace, there must be a proper environment where the dignity of the woman is respected and recognized. And there are many, many laws to that effect, many measures which have been instituted, safeguards that have been taken care of to see to it that women feel secure in the job that they are doing at the workplace that they are in. And it is not as if they have to kind of uh, compromise with their dignity for whatsoever reason. And overall, you see, at the societal level, you know, the workplace is one thing, but also reaching the workplace and getting back home after the work, and particularly if it is with regard to late hours, proper transportation, seeing to it that there is proper emphasis on the women's safety, all these are extremely important if we want to encourage girls and women to join the workforce and contribute their best to the economic growth of a country. In our country, half our country or maybe more than half lives in villages. What do you feel are the differences among the challenges faced by the government in providing women empowerment in rural areas and urban areas? And do you feel that empowering women and appreciating their contributions and ensuring that they are happy, fulfilled individuals not only contributes to health and social development, but also the economic well-being of the community, society and the country as a whole? If we try to think that the opportunities at the village level is limited, we are not wrong in assuming it. But in terms of family support and overall social security or societal stability, the village life certainly has greater opportunities because you know, the family unit is still very intact. Comparatively, the cities offer greater opportunities, so individual mobility, greater opportunities for self-development, all those things certainly are there. But then cities also mean urban areas also come with its own insecurities because each one becomes an island in itself or herself. And the kind of support that emotional or the physical that one is looking for may not be really there at the city. So each of these, you know, has its own plus and its negative points. But the point what we should realize is whether it's the urban or the rural setting, women and men overall, everyone, unless and until they're able to contribute their might and which means their health, 
their wealth and their physical security is taken care of so me then we can truly talk in terms of a good sustainable and developed society thank you so much for this insightful discussion ma'am thank you you were listening to gear and dust series special discussion on empowering women empowering nation the participants were professor sushil ramaswamy expert on women issues and sonu sood air correspondent this program was produced and presented by the news services division of all india radio you can listen to it on our mobile app news on air this program is also available on our youtube channel news on air official